This episode of Career Center is brought to you in part by the Emerging Tech Foundation and the University of Emerging Technologies. Hello and welcome to Career Center. I'm Kimberly White, Executive Director of the Career and Networking Center, a resource center focused on getting people back to work. The past few months has dramatically changed the way many of us, including the Career and Networking Center, does business. Upon receiving the stay-at-home order, we shifted our entire Empower the Job Seeker program to a virtual offering in a few short days, not knowing how long this work from home environment was going to be. The impact of this pandemic has businesses and its employees wondering what does the future hold. Today I'm joined by experts to discuss adapting the workforce with the new normal post COVID-19. We will discuss both the challenges and the opportunities. I'm happy to have with me today Cotter Sakaria, industry expert in IT, Shafiq Abu Baker, a small business expert, Janelle O'Connor, HR management and leader, and Prasad Mavaduri, industry thought leader in emerging technologies. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Carter, to talk about how, uh, you know, a lot has changed during the last three months. How did the work culture in this industry change? Thank you, Kim, really appreciate uh, and excited to be part of uh, this great panel up here. Uh, before I answer the question, let me give you a quick background of what my uh, you know, experience is. I'm a vice president for a company called RealG. We own pretty much a um, lot of um, real estate brands like Century 21 Coldwell Banker, and I'm in charge of the whole digital transformation and trying to get our brands into the digital footprint. Um, that's an excellent question, right? You know, the way things are going on, Kim, um, what COVID has actually done to us as organizations is it's not actually given us an option. It's actually mandated for us to rethink and reimagine what the workspace is going to look like, right? Um, you know, so far, we as an organization, we have looked at like functions like IT and support functions being able to be remote, but like a lot of our core functions, we were very, very um, clear that it has to be close to our brick and mortar solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And has to be in the office. And what this pandemic has actually driven us to kind of break all of the norm and force pretty much all the organizations to be more remote, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been very interesting is we've found so much organizations, um, or these subdivisions within our organization like operations like HR, like, um, you know, your business uh, teams, your legal teams, that they are all, you know, we need forced to work from home, even call centers. We have never thought that call centers can be done remotely from their home. It mm -hmm. has to be in a work solution. And this pandemic has actually driven us to rethink and reimagine and, and drive a lot of our workforce to work from remote. So it, it's been a very interesting journey for us to look through. And there's been a lot of challenges, right? Like, you know, the challenges that we've been kind of facing is, you know, balancing your work and life, right? It's mm -hmm. been very difficult because with kids being at home and, you know, your pets and everybody else who actually, you know, being there and seeing that they want to spend more time with you, how do you balance, right? You know, that has been a difficult situation. And a lot of us, like what we have actually not taken time and effort is, to build an office structure around us in our home, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've always kind of been trained that we have an office and then we have a home and home setting was like more personable. And that has been another challenge for a lot of people where, you know, they were struggling, right? They had to sit in their living room. They had to sit in their corner of a bedroom, right? In their dining room to be able to take a lot of these calls and continue to be productive and add significant value to the organization strategy, right? So there's been a quite a few of interesting challenges that's actually popped up as part of this effort, right? Um, and, and, and it's been a, a, a kind of a tough journey for all organization to kind of start you know, peeling the onion for sake to kind of talk, how do you actually go about and start addressing some of these problems so that with you as an organization still continue to progress along? Absolutely, and I'm gonna to turn to you next, Janelle. Share a little bit about yourself, but also let's talk about that employee experience that uh, we just heard about, right? The psyche of the employee and, um, you know, there's always, I think with businesses, there's, there's a, a, a need to, to focus on the customer, which we should. 
But in this environment, you also have to focus on that employee and that work environment. Sure, Kim, thanks. Um, happy to be here as well. Um, I'm a partner and chief HR officer for a professional services organization specializing in accounting technology and manages managed services throughout throughout the world actually. And you know, there's there's no better time, you know, that I see in my role as an HR leader for, for those in the human capital space to really demonstrate your value to your organization. Uh, employees of every industry are experiencing great loss, whether it be job loss, loss of you know, teacher support, um, you know, so many working parents are, are toggling, you know, work-life integ integration responsibilities, you know, even loss of things like graduations, you know, uh, the, the, the population of, of the working professionals in, in any industry is going through just profound change right now. And, you know, what we've really taken an opportunity to come at this, you know, as, as a business and demonstrate, you know, our agile approach, you know, and respond to, you know, what was suggested earlier is, you know, mandating some, some new norms. Uh, so the employee experience, you know, this is the time now, you know, that, um, you know, you really want to exercise your safety focus on your people and really think about culture and engagement and really promoting programs. Even if you're a small employer, you know, just adopting a communication strategy for being in tune with your people, mm -hmm. uh, pulsing them to see how they feel asking them how they feel about coming back to the work environment, just, just demonstrating that you care, you know, whether you're a small organization or a large one today can, can really just make a world of difference. Um, activating all the support resources, you know, as, as human resources leaders, we often talk a lot about the total rewards perspective of, of, of having numerous programs that, it, that really help the employee experience throughout time. And this is the time to really showcase those. Uh, May is actually, Mental Health Awareness Month, and this is really an important time to think about the well-being of your people, not just now, but you know, in the future, uh, whatever the future ends up looking like, you know, making sure that you're keeping safety and well-being at top of mind and really drive home that employee experience, I think is, is uh, where I'm seeing a lot of organizations focus. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Janelle. Shafiq, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, small businesses are really affected. Can you share a little bit about your um, experiences around that? Absolutely, absolutely, Kim. Uh, let me introduce myself uh, real quick. My name is Shafi Abu Baker. I'm a partner at a boutique consulting software development uh, enterprise solution at IT consulting company called Octavia USA. And also, I am the founding president of a small chamber of commerce called Illinois Muslim Chamber of Com Commerce, which is primarily focusing on, on small businesses and medium, medium and small businesses, looking at opportunity to strengthen and, and, and help them grow. So as far as small businesses are concerned, I mean, the impact of COVID-19 is affected by um, all businesses, whether they are small or large. But as you know, like majority of the, of the hit is actually on the small businesses because of several factors. And currently the main categories which are uh, being affected are those who are in personal services, hospitality, and retail businesses. For us to get an idea, most of the businesses which are really badly affected are those businesses which have 20 or lesser employees. And the factors are because of their sensitivity for adaptability, um, their, their lack of financial strength, uh, having less or no financial reserves, uh, difficulty in laying off people because these are more like family owned and personal connections relationships. This is, these are not like bigger corporations where they can let people go just like that. So these are the reasons why small businesses are very much affected in this current situation. As far as IT business, the business I am into is concerned. We are not considered as an essential business, uh, but we are a productivity tool, helping the businesses to stay in business or to improve their business. And we are affected as well. The uh, projects which were ongoing, um, they, are, they are continuing because we, as an IT industry, we were used to uh, working in remote uh, environments. However, all the new projects and the prospects which we were working on, all of them are on hold. So it's affecting small businesses like, uh, like no other time. It is, it, it is a really challenging time for small businesses. Absolutely, it, it definitely is. And so Prasad, I wanna to go to you next. Um, what are some of the trends in the new normal that you could share with us? Thank you, uh, Kim, I uh, appreciate giving me the opportunity and uh, sharing the podium with all the rest of the panel members. So my name is Prasad Mahaboduri, as you know, uh, and I have a few different hats, you know, I always I juggle the hats. 
especially uh, I, I do run, I'm the chairman of the board for a nonprofit called the Emerging Technology Foundation. So the Emerging Tech Foundation is a nonprofit which actually evangelizes the emerging technologies uh, um, and and the you know evangelizes employees especially and and make sure they are all uh, uh, they are all in, in in the trend of what is happening and this was happening even before COVID nineteen and, and and also uh, I, you know the Emerging Technology Foundation helps. Uh, and supervises a, a university called uh, University of Emerging Technologies, uh, which uh, uh, trains people in uh, uh, role-based education. It's a micro degree so that the people who get the education could be directly deployed into a job rather than just you know, being educated. Right? So that, that's, the, that's the mission that I'm on. And also I, I run an a, a IT consulting firm uh, in, uh, called Data Magnum. We have offices in the in the North American U.S., uh, Europe, and in India, right? So we do onshore, offshore, depending on where we are mm -hmm. in terms, you know, with, with respect to the customer. But I think the trends are, uh, you know, you know that. First of all, I, I really feel for the people who have lost jobs, lost jobs, lost, you know, relatives, lost everything uh, in this very, very bad uh, situation, you know, COVID uh, situation. And, uh, and and I think uh, we, we all are very sad that a lot of people have lost lives. Mm -hmm. like That's a very bad thing. Uh, and um, I think what has happened is that people started fighting with, a, with an enemy, you know, un, un, you know, unseen enemy. And, and they're hiding from it. You know, that's that's the that's the mm -hmm. the one word. If I could, you know, put it, this is the hiding from a lot of things. You know, don't know what to do, and we are trying to adapt ourselves to the new normal, right? You know, we have the remote working, we have now remote education, we have, you know, even re everything remote. You know, people are becoming uh, experts in cooking nowadays, in the, at home, and a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> remotely learning all that. But I, I think. Uh, I think the people are becoming, uh, in in a, in a way, becoming uh, very creative, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, that's one, one one thing. But the challenge is definitely people are losing jobs, as uh, my friends are here uh, told. People uh, are not able to uh, execute a, a lot of projects where they are supposed to be in, in front of the people, and then also. Uh, uh, they, they, some of the project projects are not being, you know, carried out because of the apprehension that we have. But I think uh, the whole uh, uh, the challenge right now is being remote, and still be able to do things. You know, you know, I can talk about the rest of the, you know, uh, things and, and how to overcome and all that. But right now the, the problem is very, very acute, and we have to find. People are trying to uh, uh, find, you know, ways to work remotely, learn remotely, do things remotely, and s still be happy. You know, you you speak about the steep V curve of recovery. Can you share a little bit about that? So yeah, that's what I was trying to say. So yeah. if, if you look at see, the, this is a definitely a big depression. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I always compare the depressions. You know, at least the recent one we had in in, in the in in, in two thousand eight, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what happened? You had a, almost we had 130, roughly that, at that time, 120 million you know, jobs in, in the market. Uh -huh. And then we lost a lot of them and then we recovered them. Yeah. But when we recovered, that was you know, around 2008, 2009, 2010, we lost jobs and then we started gaining them and all that stuff. And, and there is a slope, there is some kind of slope. But now, suddenly, if you see that there are around you know, 30 million jobless claims, Right. You know, it's very That's steep crazy. Yeah. and very steep. And, and the recovery will also be very steep because, you know, we cannot you know, keep on waiting. Right? You know, it mm -hmm. has to come back. The economy has to come back. So the, the challenge is a lot, lot of people are fast losing jobs and you know, applying for the, uh, the claims and all that. At the same time, uh, they are also going, uh, uh, they, they're also going, you know, coming back into, into the job market and, and, and all that stuff. You know, uh, and that is a very steep uh, uh, recovery. Because, so yeah. now uh, that is a real challenge and how to address that, you know, how to lose people and get them back. You know, usually what happens in this kind of uh, situations is you lose a lot of people, but then you, you gain them. Uh, and, but some of them will still lose jobs, but this is a, a real situation. And this mm -hmm. is, it is a totally impractical. Nobody has ever uh, really uh, uh, witnessed it, right? It's right. a very steep recovery, loose and recovery. Yeah. I don't think we could have ever predicted this. Ever, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, how is the industry suffering, Cotter? Can you share a little bit about that? 
Sure, absolutely. And I and I agree with what um, Janelle was telling and what Prasad and Shafiq were telling, right? Like there's a significant amount of job losses that's happened, right? Mm -hmm. And and the reason for that is the unpredictability, right, of mm -hmm. what the future holds. If you look at a lot of our organizations, we always actually try to model ourselves, you know, one year, three year, five year, mm -hmm. right? And then we say, okay, how are we going to staff? How are we going to you know, you know, do the investments in kind of breaking our strategy. And our strategies are dependent on this one, three and five year run as well, right? And I, I'm sure all the panel members would agree with that. Um, now the challenge has become, it's like, when is the recovery going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And our recovery, you know, investment is going to be, you know, is it going to be six months? Is it going to be one year? And then we have to adapt to it. So what is that driven is like, we've started stopping a bunch of projects, right? Anything that is actually deemed as non- essential or non-critical and you know there's a thing that we actually tell um, in the industry is called keeping the lights on it's called kplo right there's keeping the lights on and there's strategic investment there's mandatory investments as an organization we do and what happens is anything other than keep the lights on for us is all discretionary right so now the organization have decided to take the whole discretionary project and stop it or pause it right and say okay let's look at what the recovery is going to happen now, what is that driven out is like a lot of loss um, in jobs. And, um, you know, we've been trying to furlough the industry. If you look at it, they've been doing furlough employees. But the challenge with furlough is, you know, you can actually only furlough for a month or two months, right? And if you don't see a recovery in the next one or two months, what's going to happen is those furloughed employees are going to get impacted again, right? Yeah. So that is the pattern that we are in because of the uncertainty and it's driven based on what the market, you know, is is going to predict. We are struggling through that, right? Or pretty much all the organization. And I'm I'm interested in, in hearing Janelle's perspective from an HR as well, right? How they are looking at the talent pool too, right? Because that is is driving a lot of uncertainty for us. For me to also go back to my leadership and say, hey, we should do these five projects because we are expecting this steep bounce back. And you know, but then the, the immediate their question is, when is that, right? And I, and I don't have, I have to look at a magic ball to say that based on what it is, rather right. than say, you know what, it's going to be second quarter or third quarter of this year, then we have to be prepared to be able to start driving that, right? Yeah. Um, so Janelle, do you, do you, I mean, what's your thoughts on that, Janelle? Like, you know, I'm, I'm curious from an HR perspective and talent pool, what, are you guys seeing that same thing, you know, um, you know from, your, from your perspective? Right. From, from the talent perspective, you know, uh, this is the time to be assessing your talent. This is the time to be actually building pipeline, you know, for organizations who are undergoing hiring freezes or pausing on hiring. Now is actually the time to really take inventory. And, and you know, when this this pandemic first set in, you know, I, I heard a lot of organizations, including my own, you know, really talking about, you know, let, we are really going to know who our, our true players are right now as to who our players are in, in terms of the dark times and the positive times. And, you know, I would encourage any organization out there to be thinking about looking at your, your nine grid assessment, your performance management tools, how are you deploying feedback, but also, you know, don't take your eye off the market. Don't take your eye off of building pipeline, you know, oftentimes recruiting functions, whether small or large, come to a, a striking halt during situations like this. And this is any anything but that time to be continuing to use resources and, and help those who are in need, of course, you know, in, in seeking opportunities, but as organizations thinking about those future plans and modeling out what that looks like and really working on that one to three year plan, because this is gonna be something that's going to be with us a while from a people and talent perspective. Um, and even, even with the market being flooded with talent because of reductions in force and layoffs and furloughs, you know, this is, this is really when you need to really amp up your resource planning efforts and really think about how, when and if recovery comes, that may look different for every industry depending on what we're in, but how do you respond to that? How do you prepare? How do you assess your current talent? Make sure that you don't focus so largely on one versus another, you know, making sure that feedback mechanism stays in very, very positive play for your existing talent as well. So those are some of the strategies we're, we're deploying. You know, we are not pausing on any of our typical traditional human capital efforts because our, our, our employees still need those things very much during this, this transition period. So the new normal has definitely presented a number of challenges, but with those challenges, there's also opportunities and programs to help. So when we come back, our team of experts will share some of those opportunities.
This episode of Career Center is brought to you in part by the Emerging Tech Foundation and the University of Emerging Technologies. While staying at home, stay informed and connected with Naperville Community Television. Get our free news updates emailed to you once a day, Monday through Friday. These emails keep you up to date with the latest information on the COVID-19 pandemic, how it's directly impacting our city, and how we're weathering the situation together, even while apart. Visit nctv17.com slash subscribe to sign up now. This episode of Career Center is brought to you in part by the Emerging Tech Foundation and the University of Emerging Technologies. Welcome back to Career Center. I am Kimberly White and I am joined with this amazing team of experts. Lots of great information was shared in that first segment around challenges businesses and individuals are facing due to the new normal. And where there are challenges, there are also opportunities. Shafiq, I'm going to come to you first. Can you share some of those opportunities? Absolutely. Uh, small businesses now have to learn how to serve their customers in this new stay-at-home environment. Uh, this, I look at this as the fourth industrial revolution after the steam, uh, the science, internet, now the COVID-19, post-COVID-19 environment. Those in retail who relate uh, more on in, you know, in-person interactions, uh, they need to find new ways to get their product to their customers. Uh, they may have to already, they may have already revamped their website or Facebooks or in the process of doing that, uh, but there has to be more focus on uh, technology in the, to, to get help from the, using the technology to get their business moving forward. With this crisis, we have learned that several jobs we used to have in the past are going to be remote, right? Uh, examples will be telemedicine is one, uh, online education, we are seeing a lot of things in that area. Small and medium businesses mostly used in-person communication, as I said before. And uh, now technology uh, with telemedicine and online, medication, uh, online education at all, there will be more and more of technology used in those areas. There will be a larger need to train the lower strata of workers uh, because of these technological advancements or changes in the way we work. Uh, all these have financial implications. And those businesses who are going to uh, overcome that are the ones who are going to really stay in the business. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Cotter? Can you share a little bit about some of the opportunities that you see? So this, um, I see a lot of opportunities right now, right? What COVID has created at this point in time, right? Um, like I said before, like there's, there's jobs that we thought cannot be done remote. Now we've actually proved that we can get it done, right? So that actually creates a huge opportunity where the talent pool can be anywhere, right? Within the US, anywhere we can actually be and you know, still be able to contribute to organization, like corporate organizations, medium-sized, small business, right? It doesn't matter as long as it, 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 it kind of comes into the work from home framework or the remote, the remote work framework, you can, they can all be very um, significantly adding value. The other opportunity it provides also is, it's like for a lot of you know, uh, individuals to be able to retool themselves, right? Um, and, and trying to balance themselves out because there's so much opportunity, like Prasad talked about, like Janelle talked about, the HR team is actually not stopping, right? They're kind of constantly looking at how do you retool your, your teams? Like how are you going to look at new ways of getting talent, you know, managed and get the talent pool set up, get the pipeline work, right? And, and like, you know, people like Prasad kind of focusing on how do I create that talent pool, right? How do I educate them and coach them and drive them into the market is going to be very significant, right? One of the biggest trends that I've seen um, within a lot of corporate organizations is like we are actually moving away from doing an output based or a task based of from employees to more of an out 
outcome-based approach, right? Mm -hmm. And that is a huge mindset difference, right? And it has a lot of advantage and, and it's going to give a significant work and life balance to the employees, right? And I'll give you an example. And this is a real example that happened when I was actually in a conference call, right? I was in a conference call, Zoom call with, with my larger team. And one of, uh, you know, one of the team member had, you know, her daughter with her and, you know, she had to kind of teach math because the class was going on and she had to do it, but this was an important call and she had to, had to do it. And I kept asking her, like, you know what, go take a break. If you need to go balance yourself out, go ahead and focus on your kid first, and then you can come back and do the work. So what we eventually started is reimagining how our day is going to look like, right? So the day is like we actually have stand-up calls in the morning and in the evening that actually balances for everybody, right? And after that, it's their time, right? We give them a piece of work, and if it's going to take you eight hours to do it, you don't have to do it in a nine-to-five or a job. Just do when you want to do, right? And so if you want to spend three hours with your kid to kind of coach and educate them, come back, do the work, and then give a status update in the evening, perfect, go for it, right? I think those are the mind shift that's slowly happening. The industry is going to get there. Um, you know, some of us are going, and I'm, I would be interested in kind of, you know, hearing both Janelle and, and Prasad's perspective on this too, right? Because there's a big shift. And, you know, what does that do on trying to go to outcome is even your management layer has to start thinking differently, right? Yeah. It's not the way how we are thinking, like it's not the management by walk anymore. It's going to be a different way of managing these groups. But I see a huge opportunity where talent can be anywhere, you're going to be outcome based. Your work and life can be balanced pretty well. It gives a pretty significant opportunity for you to kind of focus on the perspective of how this change from more of an output based to an outcome based is going to be, you know, both from a talent and from a talent pool management as well, right? I see significant opportunities from my side where, you know, there's going to be, you know, talent can be anywhere, right? And because the outcome based, you can manage your own work and life balance. So you can balance whatever is important for you and still get the output that you're you know, looking for to, happen, uh, to be happening in a day. And it is also going to give you a much more broader spectrum of different type of jobs that you can do, right? Um, you know, the, the, the way that I'm seeing trend that's happening is we're all going to go in where, you know, every one of us can actually pick and choose multiple jobs, multiple in a work, do the work and get paid for the work and then we go on to the next one right go on to the next one that is how you know covid is you know has kind of at least accelerated that mentality what we call the whole gig economy mentality more mm -hmm. towards getting into more outcome based and so that i think is going to be a big opportunity that we can all capitalize on absolutely and for some, let's let's go to you on that education piece around that retraining and uh, uh, employees Yes. So, so the, the deal is this: the, the code is not going to keep us forever in, in the homes, right? It, you know, probably we'll come out one day out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm eagerly looking forward to that. And then people are learning a lot of things. You know, the e-learning has really, really taken off. In fact, people are learning how to do the haircut. I, it didn't come very well out, but you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but by, but learning by experience. So my, uh, you know, uh, focus and my, uh, uh, advocacy is that you know my board is asking for that is you know we have to have a role based education okay the the problem is we are pro producing the technologists especially in the technology space but not applied technologists you know we are producing probably a java guy or maybe a a dot net guy but not a web developer or maybe a a a, a, a big data developer or artificial intelligence developer because all of them the, all the technologists would be used but the the, the most important thing, especially in, in these times, is to get people employed or deployed. That means you have to have a role-based education. So that is what we're trying to do. From the foundation's point of view, we are doing the role-based education using the University of Emerging Technologies. The foundation is going to be the fiduciary and, 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 and impart the for role-based education. Okay, and, and, and what, what is happening there is, you know, the curriculum also now you, you see people are learning what is really required i mean i'm talking about the haircut through video youtube uh, or, or anything like that but basically doing learning them you know what is required in the industry is what is to be taught the the the, the, the current outlets 
uh, universities and you know other uh, uh, training institutes they are focusing more on producing the, the traditional uh, uh, education and and then you know they are not really in touch with the industry right now the covid has proven a lot of things because we know now what we need the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, environment has changed the whole outlook has changed now there has to be a feedback from the industry on what is to be learned or what is to be taught. So this is called, so the curriculum has to be set by the industry. So, um, so the curriculum has to be set by the industry. That means I call that as democratizing the curriculum. So you have to democratize the curriculum. Mm -hmm. You have to have a role-based education. You have to have and also a short form of education. It can be forever, two years, or three years at a big student loan. It has to be much more efficient and directly deployable. That is what we are working on, the, the Emerging Tech Foundation and the University of Emerging Technologies that's working on that. Creating micro degrees, 500 hours, you will be getting a job. Just as simple as digital marketing. Now the whole life, has changed, you know, everybody mm -hmm. is on, on the net now. So that itself could create a lot of jobs. So we are, we are, we are doing that. In fact, I want to tell you, uh, Kim, is that because of this uh, problem, COVID and a lot of layoffs, it, uh, the Emerging Tech Foundation has set up a page uh, for job recovery. So mm -hmm. people, they will be losing a lot of jobs, right? You know, in millions, they could come and, 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 uh, 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 and register with us. We will connect with the, the employers and by, with this artificial intelligence, we'll match them, match the jobs and the applicants. And this is gonna be a real good help. People who are interested, I'm gonna provide the link to you. And people who, who, who will be interested, who, who are interested can, be, can come there and register and, and, and take advantage of it. So in fact, this is the way we can help the situation. This is an opportunity. This is a challenge and an opportunity both. And I definitely want to uh, really see people get more and more of these micro degrees and uh, role-based education. Mm -hmm. And Janelle, from an HR standpoint, what's your, what, share some of your thoughts around this. Oh my goodness. You know, I, I think I've heard all of you comment on it here this during this segment. You know, it really comes down to trusting our people, you know, outcomes-based, you know, trusting our people, thinking about how to leverage a, a new economy of talent, whether it be through the gig economy concept, which we were already on the heels of anyway, uh, before this, this pandemic hit. Uh, but you know, there's, there's gonna be a lot of learnings that organizations you know, embark on. And, and I think that the top organizations who will rise above uh, on, on the heels of this pandemic will be those who demonstrate an agile approach, uh, starting at the leadership level, and, and really use this opportunity to project and infiltrate even the positive changes that maybe their organizations needed a nudge uh, to accomplish. And so uh, that's certainly the approach that I'm seeing. And um, you know, using this opportunity now to re-engage people and remind them why they're why they're part of our organization. You know, it's it's often how you respond in the darkest of times that puts you you know forward into the light. And I, I think organizations who are taking that approach and thinking about whatever the new uh, future is going to look like for us, you know, nano learning, you know, smaller segments of learning, you know, we're all online in, in various, uh, you know, uh, new, new rooms, meeting people that we don't necessarily need to hop on airplanes and meet anymore, you know, that we can establish relationships, um, you know, in, in many ways in a new way that we hadn't really, really considered, you know, I think the we've talked a little bit about work-life integration and how important that has always been but it's it's just remarkably important for the working professional the single parent the, the employee who's taking care of their aging parents or family members you know i think this is really where you're going to see companies you know of, of any size really think about their priorities on their people strategy and those that really use this time will, will come out ahead and apply those new learnings. And um, this is change management at its best right now for all of us. So um, there's no better time to, to keep up the momentum and the positive of, of you know, automation and opportunities that, that you know, we're all seeing right now. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a common thing among all of you around the retaining, re retraining and the retooling, right? So Shafiq, I want to just come to you real quick and just share um, how is that um, how, can you share some of those resources and opportunities around small businesses? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of a surge in outsourced work right now, uh, right? Like, you know, whichever the field is actually. Small businesses, especially those who are in, uh, in direct contact with the customers, 
they are also right now uh, doing, for example, if you look at realtors, they were they are using technology to uh, to to train uh, to actually show do the showings to their customers. So the people who were working in those environments, right, like the staffs, like right, so they are they, they need to be re they need to be trained so that they can do their functions, which they used to do earlier uh, directly with the customer. So uh, th that is an area where you know the, the retraining is very much needed and uh, uh, educational industry, as I said earlier. Uh, that there is a lot of retraining required in that area. Uh, you know, any small businesses, if you look at it, like uh, uh, the employees who used to do direct interaction with the customer, now it is uh, it is essential for them to do uh, uh, retrain. Uh, they need to be retrained so that they can do their functions effectively. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a friend who who has an event management company, and uh, now that industry, if you think about it, like you know, it's uh, completely in a completely different way. Like it's everything is in Zoom and. Uh, uh, and and so that retraining of you know like uh, retraining their employees to do uh, events and organizing uh, with the other other vendors, all those requires uh, uh, different different levels of retraining. Great, thank you so much. And Cotter, we have about a minute left. I want you to sum this up for us. It's been a great sure. conversation. Uh, absolutely, this was I agree with you, Kim. It was an excellent conversation. I'm just I'm, I'm loving it, right? To kind of understand and in some cases validate that you know pretty much all of us are kind of facing the same. Yeah. You know, issues and challenges, right? And uh, we all spoke about some of the challenges, right? But I also heard like a lot of opportunities. Right? There's a ton of opportunities. Um, you know, there, there's a saying that from Charles Darwin comes to my mind right now, right? It's not the toughest or it's not the intelligent that actually are able to adapt. It's the most adaptable one who always been, right? So I think that is what the theme that I'm actually seeing if I summarize this is how are we going to adapt to this new norm and what are the tools and techniques and processes that we can actually bring to the table and, you know, and, and bring and, and enhance like what we are trying to do, right? And, you know, I'm kind of looking at this it's pretty much like this 42% of the whole you know, workforce will be ended up being remote work, right? And how are we going to do that remote work? And how are we going to enhance it? How are we going to do a work and life balance? Because, it's, you know, as Janelle was talking about, how do you balance that workout? And how do you actually bring, you know, the mental, you know, state of folks into that as well in making sure that there's like, you know, there's a lot of balance, like virtual coffees, virtual sun, like, you know, sessions that we have, which takes them out of the norm and just focus on other things and work to kind of keep them motivated and drive them, right? In, to be more productive as part of it. And, and moving into more of an outcome base is going to drive a lot more of work being available anywhere, right? And for a lot of local communities, this is the best time, like for chambers of commerce, right? Where they can step in and say, how do I create a talent pool here, right? How do I actually get the right talent pool in my own community and make sure that I work with, like, you know, these, you know, uh, these micro learnings or nano learnings or the universities that Prasad was talking about, how do you actually you know, get them trained there and then get them into the market quickly um, and so that way they can be absorbed, right? Like, you know, so as Janelle, you know, and, and her counterparts in HR world starts looking at the pipeline and the talent, they can be absorbed into the mainstream quickly, right? So the, I kind of see the post-COVID as going to be an, 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 a quick recovery that we're going to be all focused on. And like you had mentioned, it's going to be that B model that we're going to be going in. As fast mm -hmm. as we came down, we're going to go as fast upwards because it's a global pandemic, right? It's not a region. It's not a segmented, you know, industry that was affected. It was the whole world was affected. So that reset is going to rebound pretty aggressively. And I encourage, like, you know, the, the, uh, you know, specifically chambers of commerce and communities to step in very significantly and start building, you know, this talent pools within the organization and like organizations like yours, like Kim, like the not-for-profit organizations mm -hmm. can step in and train and retrain people to kind of get into the new norm. And how do you actually get them to be able to equip, to go and sell themselves pretty quickly, right? right? Because this things are going to come so fast. And if we don't have the right talent pool to be available to do it, that is what we're going to lose, right? And I'm wishing that we are all going to be successful. And I'm hoping that we'll all come out in pretty flying colors in resetting and coming out of this pandemic. Well, I think all the information that you all shared today is definitely gonna help, right? So uh, as we look forward to emerge from, from uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much, Janelle, Cotter, Prasad, and Shafiq for joining me on this edition of Career Center. And to our, view, and to our viewing audience, if you're unemployed, underemployed, or seeking a career change, visit the careernetworkingcenter.org 
to learn more about the resources that we have available for you. Be well and thanks for watching. Thank you, Thank you Kim. Thank you. Thank you. This episode of Career Center is brought to you in part by the Emerging Tech Foundation and the University of Emerging Technologies.